Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins. We both work here at Garden Organic, helping you on your organic growing journey. Each month we like to bring you some gardening tips, whether like me you have a garden, or like Chris you live in a city and you grow on a balcony or an allotment. And we're always joined by an interesting guest whose life is shaped by gardening, and particularly organic growing. This month, Chris chats to Joe Swift, known to many through BBC TV's Gardener's World. Joe is a garden designer as well as a TV star, and it's interesting to hear how he first believed he could make a living as a gardener. It all started, apparently, when the rock band fell apart. Our post bag brings questions on whether to use old potting compost, what to do with winter-grown green manures, and a plea from a beginner gardener what should be his first plants. All this, plus a mini seed sowing masterclass, means a packed 40 minutes lies ahead. So our thanks to the Organic Gardening Catalogue who've sponsored this podcast. Chris and I love this online shop. You can find nearly everything you might need to support your organic growing. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you get 10% off everything. So just go to theorganiccatalogue.com. So wherever you're listening, if you're out running, sitting in the car, or busy in the potting shed, I hope you enjoy this month's chat and feel inspired to get growing the organic way. Hi Chris. Hi Sarah, how are you? I'm very well because I think spring has sprung. I think it, yeah, yeah, so it's a bit of a dangerous month, Mark, in many ways for the garden, because you're right, you do get that little, the first little hint yeah. The winter's over, yes. but it can come back and kick you in the teeth if you're not careful. I know, <laughs> I know, I know, but that feeling, the first warmth of the sun on your back mm. after that long, long wet winter, it's just lovely. You can feel your own sap rising, can't you? Oh, you certainly can, and it has been a bit of a brutal end to the winter, hasn't it? I mean, the wind and the rain, it's really gone for it this year, yeah. hasn't it? So yeah. you're kind of, you're mentally, you're crying out for the change of the season by this point, aren't you? Yes, you are, but I know you're absolutely right, be careful, because there's still floods and frost to come. And of course, it's different if you're in the south of the country to the north. My guess is that our listeners up in Scotland are still shivering and saying, you must be joking. Spring doesn't happen for another month. Oh, yes, yeah, so, well, I obviously haven't trained in Edinburgh. I lived in Edinburgh for a while and uh, I know it's much colder up there. I am a southern softy, Sarah, I promise you. <laughs> uh, but you're right, you know, you've got to make, take into account that the seasons, uh, the winter's a lot longer there. And also, I just think that, you know, quite a few times recently, I always associate March being quite a cold month. You kind of get this wet sort of sort of sort of, sort of months we've had in February. It's been wet. I think you could easily get a cold spell. Yeah. So you just got to be a bit careful about not jumping the gun. All, all of us gardeners want to get going. Yes. But the wisdom is in the timing of it all. I think. So seed sowing. That's always what your thoughts first turn to at this time of year. Not outside yet. Is is I would urge. It's too soon and frosts are waiting for you. So yes, keep sowing indoors now. Chris, before we talk about that, I had such fun earlier on today with our gardeners here at uh, Garden Organic, and we did a little seed sowing class, yeah. and I'll, I'll play it to you later. Very simple, I think. Seed sowing, people are nervous of it, and you needn't be. Yeah. So listen up for our little master class yeah, in a few minutes' time. Yeah, so I always think with seed sowing, I always have the rule of a tamp and sieve. I like that sort of rule of that, making sure that, that seeds have got a nice crumbly soil to burst through, a nice crumbly organic soil to burst through yeah. It's quite a nice little rule, I think. But even down south in London, you're not saying that. No, I'm not. I know it's really tempting because I know every gardener I know. In fact, if you go on Twitter or anything like that and you're following gardeners on Twitter, everybody's chomping at the bit. Yeah. So you've got your packets of seed there, all mine at home, and you're just chomping at the bit. I will be looking towards the end of the month to do a few things, hopefully. Not not too early. I think I'll probably put in my salad, some salad leaves and spinach, those kind of crops, but I will fleece them. So I'll put a fleece over the top of them. That'll help warm the soil and I'll get some germination. It just gives them a bit of a kick start and then I'll oh, okay. start. so you sow them first then sow- put the fleece over yes, the top yes yeah yeah and I'll go along you can water through the fleece because it's permeable and it just means I'm getting an earlier start to the season because of the fleece it's giving me that advantage and it also means by the time I take it off the plants are a nice little size I'm less prone to slugs and snails and that kind of thing as and well. And presumably you don't take the fleece off until your no frosts are passed. Yes, that's right. I think with some things like salad leaves and spinach, they'll take a little, little mild cold snap, so it's not too bad. I'll probably also look at, I'll put my hardy annuals in down, the, I always do like what I call a hardy annuals hedge, 
Mm -hmm. or I'll strip it on the side because that just gives me colour, gets my pollinators in, yeah. gives me a lot of pleasure. You know, for 152 quid a packet, you can just get all this colour. It's just quite incredible. So I'll be looking for them late March. Maybe if it's really cold, I might wait till April, but I would be probably looking to go with those as well. Okay, sounds very bright and colourful. And, and talking about organic principles, feed your soil, not the plant. So this March is the perfect time now as the soil is coming out of winter to give it a good, good feed. And I would recommend that you start spreading your homemade compost on top of the soil now. Not, you don't have to do it too thick, it could be maybe up to about three or four inches. Lightly rake it over, get it lightly incorporated in the top of the soil and your soil will be well fed and well prepared for that heavy growing season that's ahead of it. Well that soil's just starting to warm up now, like you said you get the warm day when you can feel it on your, on your cheeks or the back of your head. The soil will start to warm, all the bacteria, the worms, all the, all, the, all the life in the soil will start to wake up and it will pull down that mulch in to help the structure and help feed the nutrients to your plants. I think it's a good time to empty your compost bin as well because it's been there over winter. Whatever feels nice and rotted down, put out onto your beds and then put the rest of it back in again. The fact that you've got it out, turned it over, mm. has helped aerate it, which is going to help the rot down process. Certainly. If you want to know more about how to make compost, then go to the Garden Organic website. There's plenty of information there, because compost is at the heart of the organic garden. This is our foundation, isn't it, completely? That the bedrock of an organic garden is to make sure that soil's healthy. And of course, one thing I'm going to be doing, because I've got some fruit trees and bushes at the end of the garden, I'm going to rake and hoe away the soil around them just very lightly because that leaves the soil exposed. The birds will come down, in fact my hens will also get in there, and they will then be able to get at those overwintering grubs of those insects that are going to cause problems later on. Things like the gooseberry sawfly, it's a lovely organic way of dealing with pests. It certainly is, and you got those things are quite prevalent, like vine weevil, larvae, quite a lot around, leather jackets, birds love leather jackets. Years ago I was on the park we just set sprinklers up all the leather jackets would come at the surface and the birds would have a big party eating them yeah, yeah. so you're doing also to keep your weeds down especially hens they'll peck away so you're doing something very organic you know completely organically and you've got the pleasure of some feathery friends in the garden yeah that's so true and of course also clear the ground of dead leaves beneath roses particularly if they've had black spot I've been pruning my roses and clearing the ground around them yeah hygiene I mean the first day I was ever a gardener the first thing I taught and I remember I can still see the guy writing it on the blackboard DDD and that's just get rid of dead disease and dying material because it's just a hygiene thing and you're not then uh, incubating diseases for the summer ahead and I think also with, with uh, black spot it's a, it's a double-edged sword because it means your air's clean if you get it it's quite a, a common fungus and it means you're not there's not too much pollution around but you don't want masses of it basically so make sure you do a little hygiene a DDD will help you out and Chris, I know you don't have a lawn, but I do. Do you think it's time I had a look at it? I think so. March, I would certainly, as a groundsman, I spent quite a long time as a groundsman. This time of year, I'll be looking to spike it, maybe mid-March, I'll get some air aid, especially if I was on heavy soil, like a clay soil. Uh, grass doesn't like its feet wet, it likes to drain. I think also I would look, a really good, helpful thing is to um, get some top dressing. So uh, you can go to a lawn supplier, and he'll give you some, a nice sandy top dress, round wash sand, work that in with the back of a rake. Also get a scarifier over it, a lawn rake over it, get it to tiller. Break all those underground stolons and thicken it up. And that just means you're going to have a strong start to the season. Gosh, it's going to be a busy month, I can tell. It's always busy. You just know this is the quiet before the storm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun yeah. and it's great. And the growing year is ahead of us. Thanks, Chris. Now, have a listen to our Seed Sewing Masterclass. Oh, I will do. Seed sowing should be so simple. Nature seems to get it right, so why are we gardeners so scared of it? I know it took me a long time to pluck up courage and to start my plants off from seed, but once started, you realise just how satisfying and easy it can be. And given that most seed packets cost less than a cup of coffee, you can have fun trying over and over again. And you can get organic seed online, so your growing this year will be truly organic from top to toe, or should that be seed to plate? Anyway, we thought we'd have a little seed sowing masterclass to help you along. So I walked over to the Garden Organic Potting Shed to join Marchin, who was busy sowing. Okay, so now we're going to start with sowing some lettuce today. Great. We've yeah. got a seed tray or, or, or cells, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to fill it with a compost. It's okay. a seed compost. I'm going to stop you there. You're using quite 
deep cells there to grow into, but uh, does it make any difference whether you use a deeper ones or whether you use a, a seed tray, which is quite shallow? I would say it doesn't matter that much. I'm using deeper ones only because we're going to be keeping them uh, in the cell for a little bit longer. Uh, because of the weather, we're not going to be able to, to move it into the garden very soon. So and that's the, the only one allows the roots yeah, to go down yeah. deeper before having to transplant. That's it. correct. So yeah. if you use a shallow seed tray, you've got to transplant. Yeah, you have to prick them out and, and move them to something bigger uh, sooner. Okay, so now you're filling it with the seed compost. Tell me about the seed compost. Is this something you've made yourself? No, that's a, that's, a, that's a compost that we, we buy in. It's a seed compost, nice and fluffy, um, a very nice texture. It's a fertile fibre one. Um, we've but used it for the last few years. And it's specifically for seeds, isn't it? That's important. It isn't is it? for seed, yeah. It it's doesn't have that much nutrients in it. It's, it's mainly for the roots to grow into them um, uh, very easily. And, and it's mainly the, the texture of it. That's what we want, nice and fluffy and open. And of course it's peat free. It is, yes, of course. Okay, so I can see you've done that now and you've been, they're pretty much full. Each cell is pretty much full of compost. Yes. Are you pressing it down at all? I, what I usually do, I just sort of whack it on the table a couple of times to, to compress it a bit. Yep. Uh, and you're pressing it down presumably to make sure that there aren't air pockets in the... That's in the correct, box. yes. And then when you water it as well, it, it makes a difference if everything is nice and nice and flat and compacted to the right level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yep. that's ready now. Yeah. So I've got a lettuce, Amish Deetong, which is one of the HSL variety. Okay, this is from the Heritage Seed Library. That's it sounds correct. rather a special variety, but any, this will be true for any lettuce seed. It will be, yes. So the lettuce seeds are not the, the smallest ones. So I'm only going to use my fingers and, and uh, literally uh, four or five seeds per cell. So what Martin did was he emptied the seeds into the palm of his hand. So he had just a small pile in the palm of his hand. And now he's putting them in each cell. And because the cells are about two or three inches square, he's getting how many in, do you say? About four or five. The lettuce are usually quite good with germinating. There is no, no, no major issues with them. If you were doing this in a flat, shallow seed tray, would you just scatter them over the top? Um, you can do, but just be careful not to not to sort of uh, not to sort too many. That's a difficult thing to yeah. explain, isn't it? Because I think it, it's difficult to know exactly how thickly to sow your seeds. With lettuce, I think I think the the germination is really good, so so I would I would scatter them quite thinly. Okay. On top of the soil, yeah. So now they're sitting on top of the seed compost. Yes. Yeah. We're going to use a little sieve and sort of uh, sprinkle a little bit okay. on top. So these sieves are very useful to get that fine layer of compost over the top of the seed. That's correct. I mean, with the lettuce, because they're not uh, the biggest seeds, uh, you don't want to be covering them too much. So it's, it's only a little sprinkling on top to hold them in place as well. Uh, as you water later on, it sort of sometimes can wash it off. I was sometimes told, much and a rule of thumb is that the size of the seed indicates how deep you put it. So a small seed probably doesn't need very much compost on top of it, but a larger seed would want to go deeper to have more compost. That's correct. I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a general sort of rule. There will be some, some seeds that will need darkness. There will be some that need to have light exposure. So you would treat them slightly differently. But yes, in general... The smaller the seed, the uh, less of the soil on top of them, because you risk if it's if it's a small seed, you cover them too deep, they will run out of energy before they actually reach the sun. Uh, okay, so listener, what you can't see is that Martin has now scattered very sieved very finely the compost over the top. He's pressed it down again, yeah. and I'm guessing you're going to water them now. I will water. Well, I would say as well, don't don't overfill the the tray. If you leave a little bit of a gap say to the quarter top, of an inch quarter the top. of an inch, then when you water none of the compost will flush out of, ah, of the tray good tip. as well. Good tip. So now we can water it with a fine rose so we don't have to displace the seeds. Yes, because that so often happens is that you little over enthusiastic with the watering and all the seeds wash out <laughs> yes, or appear up on the surface and stare at you again. That's correct, yeah, especially with the smaller seeds. They will, yeah. they will sort of displace yeah. themselves. So water gently with a fine spray. Yeah, and in case of lettuce, uh, cold glass house or, or a little bit of heat, uh, that should do it this time of the year. Again, it varies, doesn't it, according to the seeds of the plants that you're growing as to how warm they need to be, how often you need to water them. It's difficult to have a general view on that. Read your seed packet, 
ask a friend, ask a neighbour, but on the whole, yes, each seed is perhaps different in its demands. Yeah, that's it. That's what you, what you said is correct. Just always check your packet and, and it should all the information that you need should be there. So if you're not sure, check on the, on the uh, instructions. You can always check it online as well if, if you've lost the original packaging. Every seed's going to have slightly different requirements. So. Fantastic, Martin. Well, that has been very helpful, and I hope it's helped anyone who feels nervous about seed sowing just showing actually how simple it can be. It is simple, and uh, the, the best thing is to try. Give it a go and see for yourself. Our interview this month is with a man who happily sows seeds while millions watch. Joe Swift has been a presenter on Gardener's World for many years. Viewers love his warm, easy manner with growers of all abilities, from the beginner with a new garden to the Chelsea Show gold winner. Chris caught up with him in his busy schedule and the two old mates settled down for a chat. Right then, I'm here at the Dalston Curve Cafe, an amazing little outdoor garden with Mr Joe Swift. Nice to see you, Joe. Good morning. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule to talk to the Garden Organic. Yeah, we're just around the corner from here. I know, you've done all right. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. We're both local to this area. Uh, it's, really, it's nice to see you, and I suppose, in a way, there's nobody in Garnet that doesn't know the name Joe Swift, I would have said. You, you know, that's, you've been around a while, haven't you? Not, not <laughs> yeah. saying you're ancient or anything, but you are. You've no, been in Garnet's world, I think, 22 years. I was going to say, yeah. I mean, that's... A, and, years. It's incredible, because having worked in telly myself, it's such a fickle business. Yeah. Now, I think that is an incredible achievement, 22 years. I'm quite interested to know how you managed it, man. What do you think? No, I don't know. They just, you know, they give me a one-year contract and every year they go, do you want to do some more? And it's like, okay, yeah, great. And for years I was the youngest, you know, on there until they yeah. got Francis and Adam, uh, Adam Frost and all that. And they kept saying, we need to get younger, you know, younger viewers, younger viewers. And I was thinking, well, hang on, I'm, fi- I'm 50. <laughs> yeah. I'm in my 50s yeah, now, yeah. and I'm still the youngest presenter on yeah. there. So it's, um, so it's great, no, it's great that, they, for, that they do that. But I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know. Well, you're obviously doing something right. I mean, I, when I watch, I think where you're really strong is you're very good with contributors, aren't you? Yeah, I like chatting to people like you do, you know, it's, mm. I, you know, because you're either talking to camera directly or you're chatting to people and I feel that yeah when I'm going to someone's gardens or talking to a specialist you know you sort of got to play the role of someone who's sort of informed yes. but not the expert you know so you've got to be slightly careful that you don't sort of take over and say oh yeah that's that and that's that and that's it's that it's quite tricky that. it's quite it tricky quite sometimes because really you see really stuff you know it could be done better yeah. or yeah. yeah I'm genuinely interested yeah. you know when I go out and, you know and there's nothing you know I'm very privileged you know to go off to a nursery or a garden for a day to film you know have access to yeah. you know an amazing garden perhaps um, and an amazing contributor and you know it's um, I'm very lucky yes yeah, it's, it's good it's very stimulating work isn't it I should yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so I've got to ask I suppose it's the obvious question is wh- how, where did what inspired you to get into the garden into gardening um well <laughs> I, was, I was in a band I was uh, I'm an art school dropout right and uh, I was in a band I played bass in a band and uh, we were doing all right we sort of you know, we were playing a lot of, sort of pubs and clubs around North London and then you know the old classic of the uh, lead singers girlfriend start you know girls going out with the rhythm guitarist and, something like that, <laughs> and the whole band split up and I went off on a kibbutz in Israel right which a lot of people did in the 80s because uh, you know you, you didn't have any money all we needed to do was like get about 30 quid to get 40 quid to get for a flight out there and friends of my sisters had been out over six months you know they went a- looking a bit peaky and came back looking all bronzed and healthy <laughs> um, and said they'd had a great time so I went out there and I was working on fish farms and the date farms out there for six months and then came back to the UK and just needed to get a job yeah. and I didn't know what I didn't know what I wanted to do but a friend of mine was working for a gardening company up in North London and he just said oh I can get you a job and um, you know uh, are you interested and I started doing the maintenance working with this amazing gardener called Antonia Sturgis who was a sort of Right old hippie guard. Yeah. Terrible yeah. driver. So I had to drive the van around because she, she kept crashing it. Um, and I worked for in the maintenance division, which was basically me and her for about a year. <laughs> and then I moved over to the landscaping division, which was mi- mixing up muck for the brickies and the yeah. pavers. Yeah, start, starting at square one. Starting at square one, you know. And I did sort of two, three years there. And then I went to Australia and I landscaped over in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and then, uh, then I came back, and then I started, and then I decided I wanted to get into it more. Study garden design, yeah. So yeah, that's what. So there was a transition, was it? Do you think from between sort of hands on, and then you decided to get what? What encouraged yeah. you to be a designer? Because you were one of the original. There's loads of them now. Yeah. Well, I tell you yeah. what, what. A friend of mine's mum said, uh, "Okay, you know, you, you know, you know about gardening. Da, 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 can you design my garden?" I was like, "Yeah, you know, I've got a, a, a O level B in graphical communication. <laughs> who used to be technical drawing." Um, and I and I thought, yeah, and I sat down with this blank piece of paper. And I literally, I literally didn't know where to start about yeah. design. And I thought, do you start by the tree in the corner? You know, I'd, I'd map the whole thing out. 
And I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to go go and study garden design. And then there was only two colleges. There was no degrees. It was either landscape architecture. I didn't have any A levels. And so you either did went to Inchpool School of Garden Design, which was seven grand, or you went to the English Gardening School, which was three grand. Right. And so I went to English Gardening School and just loved it. I loved it. You, know. so you knew you knew then that was for you, basically. Yeah, yeah, because it was sort of I had the practical. You know, a lot of people there didn't have the practical skills of how to build walls, level steps. You know, soil digging out. I understood that because I, you know, yeah, which is you have to be incredibly practical as a, as a designer, as a gardener, as you know anybody who works that. It's a practical thing. subject, isn't it? You could, I remember when I was at Edinburgh Botanics, it's a similar thing. There was a lot of academics, but having that sort of hands-on experience was really, really important yeah. later down the line. Yeah, yeah very important, mm. very important. So you know, and so actually, then trying to you know add that creative element to it, um, I just really liked it, and then. I set up a landscaping business with my old mate Mark Williams, and we were called Williams and Swift Landscape. So, you know, we were maintaining gardens, we were building gardens. I w- we were building also for other designers that I'd met on this course. A lot of sort of middle age, middle aged lady from ladies from Clapham and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then I started getting the odd little design right. job myself because it's very hard to just say, okay, I'm a garden designer now. Yeah. You know, and get a load of work. Well, you need a portfolio, I suppose. And yeah. And you know, people don't really trust you. And if you got, you know, you got to start with a little back corner here, front garden there, you know, and repaving a bit here. And then suddenly someone will say, would well, you want to do the whole thing? And, yeah. Um, and we designed and built, so we sort of had control over the builds, which was good. Um, yeah, and then I started doing a bit of TV and all that sort of stuff. So then from there, so it was interesting because now, like I mentioned, there's, I mean, design is the thing. There's millions yeah. of them everywhere. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, it's, it's, true. True. Yeah. it's true. There are more gardeners, there are designers than there are gardeners. It feels yeah, anyway. Yeah, really, are. So, but, but there's some of them are really exceptional. Do you have an inspiration? I always, yeah. I always remember thinking John Brooks. I really, really liked. Yeah. And is there anyone yeah, in particular? Like, well, Dan Pearson. I've always yeah. admired him, and he was on the telly. There was a um, there was a Channel Four program. Uh, Garden Doctors, it was called, and it was him with um, Steve. I remember uh, Steve Bradley. It was it Steve Bradley? Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. And, and Dan was, you know, they were doing these roof terraces and they were doing small spaces, and and it was sort of the first. It was very different. I watched, always watched Garden as well. Jeff Hamilton and then Alan Titchmarsh, you know. But this was sort of wow, uh, that whole makeover thing before Ground Force. Actually. Yes. Um, and so Dan and Dan Pearson, he's a bit of a hero of mine, really. He, he's a really talented guy, isn't he? I yeah, think, yeah. And, and, and very much into the plant communities. That sort of yeah, very, very quite organic in his approach to very what he does. Organic. Yeah, yeah. He'll put plants together and sort of see where they end up, rather than let's go smash everything up, rip yes. everything out. Yeah. And I think you know, I think we've got a lot to learn from him. I think well, because he's definitely a plant, what I call plant-based designer. Where a lot of yeah. them kind of go into what kind of stone they want. What kind of, that yeah. doesn't interest me. I'm looking for plants, yeah. really. In that. Yeah. That's it. So you must. I mean, obviously big part of Chelsea Flower Show you must have seen yeah. a lot of changes over the last two decades since you sort of getting into telly yeah 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 I mean there was you know uh, at the time there was a lot of very minimal you know, it was that min- whole minimalist sort of garden thing and now it's all plants 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 which is great um but it's still showmanship, isn't it? It's, sort it's of, very much uh, a, a catwalk in many ways, I suppose. Is it? Was that a good word totally, to use it? Totally, yeah. That's exactly what I say, you know. And, and it slightly winds me up that the RHS, you know, go bang on about the, the sustainability of the Chelsea Flower Show because we all know it's a bit of a circus, really. Yeah. You know, it is. It's, you know, the amount of time, effort and energy... Yeah, we're definitely in Hackney anyway. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, there's someone, someone off, someone's late for the tea break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the time and the effort and the energy that goes into the show and, you know, three-week builds and then it's up for a week and it disappears. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing sustainable, sustainable about, about that. So I suppose they'll you know, argue it's that... It's education. Yes, it is. Right. They'll argue that you're putting a window to the wider... Pit. I suppose they'll argue yeah. that, won't they? But people no, are... I see, it as a, I see it like you say, as a yeah. catwalk of design yeah. and plants and the whole extravagant... And it's incredibly right. competitive, isn't it? Yeah, Do you see yeah, that? Yeah, I love <laughs> the competitive <laughs> yeah, element. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I really... No, you know, I like sort of saying, oh, well, they've got a silver gilt and they've got a, a gold or and they're very competitive you know incredibly you, so you know it's all very sort of tasteful and everything but it's not just the designers it's the nurseries it's everyone right across the board and I like I like that competitive, <laughs> competitive. and so you're right on the spot aren't you there you're because you're sort of round there waiting for the medals to come out and you're getting yeah. the reaction how does I remember doing yeah. it at Hampton Court years ago when I was doing a bit of telly and uh, that's quite an experience isn't it yeah it is because uh, you know yeah some people are really upset I mean yeah, because they're all it doesn't matter what they've done they're exhausted as yeah, well right so, yeah. so they're so tired they're going to burst into tears pretty much whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. medal they so whether it's a, a gold or a bronze yeah yeah you know yeah. and also um, you know you've got to be quite careful because a bronze does look like a gold so you can open that envelope <laughs> and it's like wow and I'm brilliant I've got a bronze 
people get upset but they also are some people it's lovely when someone opens it and they get a silver or a silver kilt and are so pleased with that it's their first time at yeah. Chelsea and they're like wow I've got a silver yeah. at Chelsea it's like, yeah. that's great and the last few years I've so got into you know got into the personalities the characters the emotion of the whole thing um, more than the gardens and the plants in a funny sort of way I mean I love the emotion you know and the returning the returning nurserymen and all that sort of stuff so. it's, it's quite the community's quite interesting but like, I've obviously done little discovery gardens the last couple yeah. of years the camaraderie wants the you're with the growers maybe in the pub afterwards or you know you do get that real sort of Definitely. feeling they're a bit all in it together and everyone kind of appreciates how hard each other have worked yeah 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 and it's exceptional it's an exceptional thing and it's, it's it is I mean there are other flower shows and people say well what about you know Hampton what about it is but Chelsea has just got something special yeah know? sure and I suppose and then you just mentioned how things had changed last year it was very um I mean, a lot of stuff out there last year would have been would have classed as weeds, wouldn't we? If you think yeah, about, yeah. you know, them, I saw nettles, I saw... Dirt and it's dirty, you just get them everywhere, you know. Yeah. Which would have... <laughs> that would have been a no-no. Cow parsley all over the yeah, shop. That's and, been, yeah, that's been... But popular. that's... Don't you think that's... No, because the environmental, you know, the whole wildlife, the naturalistic... Um, I mean, it does encompass... You do... I like it. You Sometimes you get a really formal garden, sometimes you get maybe a Japanese garden, something, you know. But I think over the years, we have... Uh, and I think the buzzword for this year is definitely, you know, we have biodiversity, environmental issues and, and all that sort of stuff. So you think that definitely I've noticed that everything's moving towards organic isn't it? The peat, peat free uh, movement's getting stronger. We're definitely in a twin change. If you speak to younger people the environment is a massive. massive I'm yeah. sure your kids are thinking about it. Yeah. You know that's the way it was. Is it organic important to you? Yeah. Yeah it is important. I mean I'm not, I wouldn't call myself fully 100% organic mm. gardener. I mean I'll call myself something like that. I sort of tell myself as easy organic. You know so um, I sort of, I bring in stuff. I mean, I don't use pesticides. I don't use chemicals yeah. or anything. But to be fully organic, you've got to be sort of, you know, so, uh, you know in, uh, self-dependent, really. Yeah, you do, on, yeah. On your garden. And I, I'm happy to sort of bring in a load of, uh, you know, mulch or whatever if I need it uh, yeah. on, on a certain job. Um, and often the plants, that, you know, the plants that you're buying in, you know, to actually have them all certified organic is quite tricky. Uh, yeah, I think it's to know so where know the sourcing of that and where from plugs or from seed or whatever, what, you know, where where they've been grown when they get to, and when they get to your stage in you know, like a five litre pot or something. Sure, I think that what garden what garden organic will say is it's something we have to aspire to. If you make small changes yeah. in your approach, then lots of small things make us a larger picture. Definitely. I suppose. Yeah, yeah definitely. Throw a gardener's whole life last year he was completely peat free totally organic and had the most amazing hostas you know just proving it can be done it can I mean through Garden Organic the catalogue I'm talking to growers who are all going peat free because they kind of see the writing on the wall a little bit yeah. I think yeah yeah exactly um, and the whole chemical thing and I think yeah and I think gardeners are a big a big part of that and you know yeah I mean the changes I've seen over the years where people would just slosh glyphosate around everywhere and just spray the hell out of everything you know um, things are changing rapidly but you also you know Jeff Hamilton was always organic yeah. Mon- it's not new, thing. is it? It's, it's not, not new. new. It's beca- it is mainstream. It's become mainstream. It's, be, it's, it's just getting more focused, which is a good thing, I think, for all of us, really. And do you find that when you deal with clients, I don't know how uh, active you are still building gardens, but the yeah. clients you talk to, are they all looking for organic methods, are they? Is yeah, it? I, well, I think you have to just sort of advise them and say, you know, we don't, <clears throat> we don't do this and we don't do that. And they just go with, they tend to go with whatever you sort of say. So they but just you, take your advice. But you are thinking about sustainability. I mean, you know, often, you know, you have to advise them about planting, you know, if they want a lot of, you know, uh, you know, high maintenance, moisture loving plants, and they've got uh, lots of dry soil, it's not going to work, and you've got to, you know, advise them on that, really. Yeah, sure. So you are giving them pointers, basically, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So you kind of like, do you think it's easy to do it in smaller urban gardens? Do you think they could, some city dwellers can really embrace? Yeah, definitely. Um, but there's that whole sort of, you know, you need to go a bit wild, you need to step back, you need to relax, you need to not be a complete control freak. Um, and you know, I think the thing about small gardens is if it get very small, people, you know, want a lot, you know, sort of large seating areas and to connect it to the house and everything. But there's always a way, there's always a way of, of, of just letting, I mean, you know, there's a sort of a fine line between a controlled design garden and something that is sure. loose and wildlife friendly. And, so they, they, those worlds, it's hard to get them to overlap, I suppose, in certain respects, is it? Yeah, but I think a, a good designer can do can do that in a way. You know, you got to think of canopies, haven't you? You got to think of trees, and then sort of you know mistory shrubs. And a lot of people will just think of small plants in a small garden. Yeah. Do you think you should be more ambitious than that? You know? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think there are some design rules that can be followed.
follows, you know, greening up, you know, greening up your boundaries, greening up your walls, and uh, and then always adding tree, you know, sort of small trees and shrubs even into a small space, you know, for sort of shade and for for, for cover for birds and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and I think that we are, yeah, I think we are definitely changing our attitudes and changing our spaces. I mean, it used to be when I first started, it was it was like okay, minimal, we're going to pave this whole thing, and we might have three or four plants in it. Yeah, now it's okay. Plants are the dominant feature. Yeah. And we've also kind of the whole wildlife, this whole idea of, since, so since I've started gardening, that it's a shared space with nature, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And wanting to look onto more greenery yeah. and more plants yeah. and not just wanting to look onto some furniture. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? So before, I mean, the, the, I think the days of like, like you say, a, a lot of hard landscaping with some nice box balls in pots. Yeah. So kind of maybe that's maybe over. Do you think? Yeah, I do. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, me yeah too. I, I know I've done a bit of that myself. You know? Yeah, we all have. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think things have moved on now. I think we really value the outside space and clients uh, are very. You know, they might not know what they want, but they they could, they're sort of quite easily led to to that. Sure, that they don't have to listen to the expert, don't they? Yeah, but yeah. to make a sort of you know, a garden that feels alive mm. in lots of respects. See, so I know this is a bit of a strange question, I suppose, in a way, or a hard one to answer, but do you see anything, tre- what trends will be coming in the future? As a, so obviously, man goes around all the flower shows, do you, do you see what's coming soon in the, in the head? Not really. No, oh, it's God. impossible, is it? Yeah, well, I just think, I, I think it's a sort of philosophy, and I think, I, I do think the environmental philosophy, the wildlife, biodiversity, sort of easy, easy gardening, small space gardening, gardening wherever you can get your, yeah, wherever you can get your hands on it. I think the idea of just mowing lawns and, and clipping stuff back all the time is, is gone. And yeah. I hope so anyway. But at the same time, you know, I get on the train, I go all over the UK, sit on the trains, look into people's back gardens, and you see the rectangle with the borders yeah. around the outside and the lawn yeah. that gets mowed every week in yeah. the middle. And the giant trampoline. And, <laughs> and the A to Z path in the shed. Yeah. You know, and as a designer, I'm like, I do, the, do a whole talk of just trying to get people away from that sure. idea. You know, we've got magazines, we've got TV programs, with books, it's like so much inspiration out there. But that is a yeah. real problem that people are just stuck in that rectangle. Do, do you think that maybe it's because people, we haven't managed to conquer, I mean, there, we've got a very hardcore of people in this country that love horticulture, haven't we, that are so, are so um, dedicated to it. But on the population mass, do you think there's still a long way to go? Yeah, I also think there's people who love love gardening and love plants, but then that crossover from design, which is to break that space up, and you know, people are like, oh, I'm not a designer, you know, designs for other people, you know, but the actual idea that, you know, if you're placing a plant next to another plant, you're designing with plants, and you can't be a good designer without understanding plants either, so that, I think that, that huge crossover from yeah. one to another. And do you think that maybe in order to get that message over, we it needs to, we need to be more main, we need to be more gardening programmes, more, I think, because it feels like there's a lot of it to me, or do you think there's not enough? We got, but I, I think it's part of the British psyche. This rectangle thing, really, the lawn, interesting, and the rectangle. And I don't know what it. <laughs> I, and I, I'd love to smash it to pieces. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. You know, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, it's like we're going to lay the lawn in the middle, and we'll have, we'll have a two foot border all the way around. You put your bird, your bird feeder up, and that's it. And yeah, that, and that's it. And that, it, it can be so much more. I suppose it's our job to go and excite people more than that. And. Uh, uh, I, th- I just have a lot of faith in the young generation when they get their first little plot. Yeah. You know, that they're going to do. I think, things. having spent time in schools, I think definitely things are changing. I think that also, do you think social media might be having a massive influence yeah, on things? Yeah, and also I write for the Radio Times every week, and this year, you know, the brief is, OK, we want to go environmental, we want to go more wildlife, we want to go more organic. You know, they're actually setting a brief for me. I mean, this is like my fifth year doing it, and that's great because they know that that's... And that's, yeah. the Radio Times is very mainstream, you know, so mm. it's, it's great that that's, that there's a sort of bias towards that. The, the wind is behind the organic movement, the environmental movement, quite heavily, I think, yeah. on the ground. Around, isn't yeah, it? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. We were very formal. When I started going on the parts, it was all straight edges and and it, we were weeding and sort of weed we were on it and now we've become much more relaxed about it all haven't we? because we want that the sound of the bird life etc yeah. we want all that going on. Yeah that's what going for me is it's got to feel alive. You know, yeah, as, all, all, as much of the year round as possible. Do you think? I mean, do you know you've got gardens well coming up for the year? Do you have some idea what they get you to do? Because I've got a feeling they'll be quite big on the environment and organic and stuff, yeah. won't they? Yeah, and also uh, some community gardening. We uh, did some last year, um, some allotments, helping sort of projects, sort of uh, kickstart. Really, we can't sort of you know we can't go and do the whole thing for some sure. of these guys, but they might. So you be. set it up basically. Well, we'll go there for you know for for a couple of days, and maybe I'll, I'll do, you know help design something and organise a space to just sort of like get them on their way and you know there's been some great we were some great projects last year so I'll be doing a bit of that um, also I tend to go and interview like you know any celebrity who's a king yeah. gardener <laughs> how's you know, that how Will, Will Young I went and oh yeah him. I saw that yeah, cause it was great because he, yeah. he you know he's, he gardened all his life when he was when he was studying he was always like jobbing uh, you know jobbing gardening yeah. and stuff so he was 
he was he was really great. He was such a nice guy and really into really into it, you know. Because I suppose those support people I haven't crossed to myself is they kind of there's a perception of who they are because they're known, aren't they? And, they, and yeah. what they are in reality tend to be different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a very down to earth guy, and yeah, you know, and he talked about mental health, you know, and yeah. gardening, which is really important. But the, but the big well being thing is huge. Isn't the it? whole well being thing. And, yeah. uh No, he was he 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 was sort of quite inspiring, really, um, as a guy. And so, so you know, I think, you know, I, I know there'll be some purists who'll say, "Hang on, what are you, why are you putting Will Young on?" You know, but he will appeal to. Yeah, he's got. You've got to try and reach out to an yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah, really, I mean, you can't be. It, 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 it can get a bit snobby sometimes, can't it, Garland? Don't you think? It yeah, can yeah. a bit like we are. We know what we know, and it's like, can it, it almost make it a bit of a private club. No, we want to get out to young people. Yeah, we, we want to get out all sorts. Yeah, of and I say we've got to put the world into Garden as well. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant know, expression. Because otherwise, it becomes a little bit insular. Yeah, and there is this community gardens going on. There's people gardening all sorts of different ways. Um, and everybody's doing it, and the more we can encourage it, there are no downsides to No, I like that. We've got to put the world into garden as well. Yeah. That's a great yeah. expression. And I think that also is, um, if you don't do that, then it doesn't continue, doesn't it? And, and yeah. what's interesting about garden, don't you think, is it, it's, it's got such an influence in many ways. It's yeah. a very underrated subject matter. Totally. Yeah, it crosses everything, doesn't it? It crosses, uh, um, you know, age and race, you know. Education, you know, yeah. Education, you know, uh, Health, well-being, mental health—I mean, everything. You can, you know, there's so it really is, and I think that's why anyone who's in it loves it and yeah. realizes, you know, that how important it is. Um, but it is sort of seen as, yeah, it's sort of seen as sometimes a little superfluous. I'm also on, on the, the uh, patron of uh, a couple of charities, as well like a garden classroom just around the corner from here. Yeah. It's like basically takes kids from um, you know inner city areas. And, and teaches them cross-curricular stuff out in an outdoor environment. So they'll yeah. do science, they'll do literacy, they'll do numeracy, they'll just do it, out, do it outdoors, and they love it. You know, you're probably like me when you were yeah. you didn't want to sit in a classroom. No, I was always looking out the window. You know, yeah. and some of these kids, you can't fit in that, are you enjoying it? And they're like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. brilliant. Not yeah. stuck in, you know, in the classroom doing it. And That's a great feedback when you see that, because it kind of gives you a bit of optimism for the future, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and there's quite a lot of schemes like that going mm. on. So, And uh, Horatio's Garden, uh, I'm involved with, which is this man of spinal unit garden yeah, like I did last year which uh, I'm going up there next week and that's a design and build is it yeah well we've done it our whole thing yeah. is open and it's up and running it's amazing I mean as a designer it's the most f- fulfilling garden I've ever designed brilliant I've seen it uh, populated with you know, people in wheelchairs in beds with their family and friends just getting out of the sterile environment of a hospital yeah and we've got a head gardener there and loads of volunteers so I'm going to take we're, we're, we're going to be sort of tweaking some of the perennial planting um, putting in some more shrubs and stuff like that but it looks amazing already, so it's just tweaking, tweaking. Sure. Here and there. Can you find, can people find out more about that on social media, websites, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Horatio, yeah, it's horatios.org.uk. And there are, and there's going to be there's eleven spinal units throughout the UK, and Bunny Guinness is someone. So there's four open. Tom Schultz Smith is doing one and a half. Yeah. Sure. They're going to be all of them are going to have a Horatio garden. Yeah, brilliant. With it. Excellent work. Yeah. Excellent, which, is, which can only be a good thing. Now, this is probably the we're in quiet before the storm few isn't it with the show season coming up you yeah. must be full at it aren't you from sort of what, what yeah, point onwards yeah well it's sort of Malvern's the first one but um, it's sort of yeah it's sort of a mid-April really it sort of kicks off um, I'm meant to be going to China this year <laughs> oh, so yeah. in mid-April for, for seven days we'll see what happens with that one yeah. um, but there's a big flower show out there I'm, I'm going, to, going to teach some Chinese about garden design which would be interesting but then yeah Malvern it goes Malvern Chelsea you know um, well, there's uh, Chatsworth now, Golden yeah. World Live. So that's Hampton, a continual stream, Saturn, isn't it? It's pretty much, yeah. It's like, yeah, from one to the other. And it's great because, you know, I'm, I spent, you know, I'm being a garden designer, I spend a lot of time by myself in front of a computer. So it's quite nice, you know, working with other people and going and seeing what's out there and socialising and, you know, seeing yeah, lots of gardens and lots of nurserymen and all that sort of stuff. It's great. Yeah. It's great. So the, winter, the winter is just a t- about two months too long in this country. And actually, I think, I suppose, we kind of, although it gets really manically busy, are you chomping at the bit a bit when, it, when you see the first yeah. shoots of spring and you're yeah. raring to go? Yeah, I am. I am. And then, it, you know, and then it'll freeze over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can sort of peak too early, um, yeah. a little bit, but um, um, it's a long old season. I wish they had something in September. You know, to uh, uh, one of the shows in September, they shifted one, so everyone comes back from their holidays, and you know, their garden's a bit of a mess, and they're looking at. Yeah. You, you know, who's going to who's going to stick a load of plants in their garden in the end of July anyway? Yeah. You know, and then go on holiday for a couple of weeks, come back, and they're all frazzled, right? You know. Yeah, sure. It's I think not, that's a really valid yeah. point because it, yeah, that's planting time, isn't it? September, October, yeah, exactly. you should be getting stuff in the grounds. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so uh, when you're not doing all this, you, I know you, you've got you've gone over to France. 
France, don't you? So what are you doing to yeah, relax? I've got, What's yeah, your... I've got a place in France I've had for 15 years with the name because I've got a, only a very small garden in Hackney. It's like 50 foot by 20 foot. And I sort of, you know, I've done everything I can. And I go around pottering around and you can't really swing a shovel in there. <laughs> I've got an acre in France that I've been working on single-handedly. Um, mm. But, you know, we just spend a lot of time working on the house and doing lots of stuff. But now I turn my attention to the garden. And, so, yeah, I've, like, been barrowing soil and chopping stuff back. And I took a load of plants down there and been planting out a load of perennials. And, yeah, it's got to sort of be sustainable. It's got to be stuff that can look after itself. But I'm really excited about it. Yeah. And it's my, you know, I've got this, this space. And it's so, so you can just, yeah, and you can just develop it. And, yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah he's, got, he's got to work for me. And I, yeah, he's got, exactly. There's no client. I am the client. And, yeah. you know, I'm not doing any drawings. I'm just doing it all on the ground. So you have this great freedom to it then. Really, yeah. Which is, yeah. Yeah, and also, you know, I do nothing better than just getting out and sort of chopping stuff back and, prude, you know, and just being out. I'm, out. I'm outdoors all day, every day down there. Yeah, um, brilliant. And I love it. And, you know, being in a city, there's, there's a lot of advantages of a city, but there are a lot of restrictions as well. Yeah, you, know, you feel so connected with nature, and I've got all my bird feeders up there, yeah. and it all goes crazy. And you know, I love it. So I am developing my own garden because you know, after having you know been a garden designer in 1990, I studied. So yeah, okay, so we're now 30 years in. Yeah, I thought I want a nice garden. <laughs> about, about time I had, time yeah. I had a nice bloody garden. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're working on everybody else's, and you're going around filming everybody else's, and you think, actually, I want one. And it sounds like, it also sounds like a bit of a legacy, doesn't it? If you're going to do, you say about you would plant a load of perennials? Yeah, I've got a load of perennials. I'll put a load of sort of hedging in. It's, you know, it's... Um, so you're going for it big time stuff. with the plants then? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, because uh, otherwise it's just sort of mowing and... Uh, no, I'm, yeah, there's lots of plants. Yeah. I'm trying to establish sort of areas, wildflower areas. And... So there's an organic sort of environmental yeah. theme to it as well. Yeah, you know? definitely. Oh, yeah, because I want loads of bees and butterflies coming in. Um, it's been a bit sterile. It's overlooking vineyards, which actually are great, beautifully, but beautiful, but they are quite sterile in the environment. So, sure. Um, but we're starting to buy some bits of woodland as well. But no, I just want, I just want it to feel totally, I want it to buzz in the summer. You know? Yeah, sure. You just want all that wildlife. But I've always got stuff going on, so, you know, I'm sort of... You're never bored. Thanks for uh, your time, mate. It's yeah, always a chat. No doubt we'll see each other on the scene as the show yeah, starts. Yeah, yeah, well, season. I always see you. Right? Yeah, well, you, know, you do them all as well. We get, we get about, my friend, don't we? You do. Yeah, it's it's, it's a nice one, nice Joe. One. Cheers, Cheers, mate. Cheers. I like that Joe talks about putting the world in Gardner's world. We grow in such different spaces across the country, and I'm conscious that you, the listener, may have a huge veg patch, or maybe just a few pots on the patio. I hope that in these podcasts, Chris and I, between us, can help you in your organic gardening world, wherever it may be. Talking of which, I'm making my way over to the potting shed right now to open up the post bag, and I'm joined by Hannah, Anton, and Chris. Uh, Hannah. Yes, so I've got three nice meaty questions here. So starting off with compost. Um, Someone's written in to say they have some old bags of potting compost and can they still use them again this year? Chris, what would you say? Well, it depends on a few things. Obviously, I I think if I was growing younger plants, plants I've pricked out, say, or smaller plants, I would like a fresh compost because compost will leach, especially if it's been opened or it's been exposed in any way. But that doesn't mean you have to waste those bags of compost. You can use them... Uh, as a mulch on your borders, your old bags, or you can even put them into a big pot and add some fertiliser, like slow-release comfrey pellets. So you can still use it, but for anything new that you're growing young, I would definitely be tempted to go out and buy myself some fresh wood just to be on the safe side. You can also add it to your compost heap, and that's another way of utilising it. I'd just like to add to that, it's particularly important if you've had a bag that's been opened for quite a while, then scarred flies will come in and lay their eggs, and they're the little flies that dance around on the top of your compost. They might look... Harmless. Yeah, they don't look like anything, but they will cause you grief. <laughs> but once they've laid their eggs in there, they, the little maggots eat away at the roots and make, and they can actually destroy your plants. In fact, sometimes that's the reason your plants don't come up, is because those little blighters are eating away at them just as they're coming up. So definitely, if it's been opened, don't use them for young plants. Especially when you kept it in the greenhouse. Certainly. Yeah. Actually, Hannah, this is very interesting because next month we're going to do a whole feature on bagged compost and compost in general. Peat-free, of course. Okay, right. Um, so the next question, someone's said they sow some field beans as a green manure last autumn and what should they be doing with them? Anton. Okay, so first I'd perhaps better explain what a green manure is because yes, not please. everybody is familiar with that. And it's a bit of a sort of confusing name, green manure, because it hasn't got anything to do with manure at all. It's actually plants which are grown to improve the soil. And 
Field beans is an example of this. Field beans are really useful as a green manure because you can sow them quite late into, into October when perhaps other green manures won't germinate. And you grow them over the winter and then you need to cut them down in the spring and they will release lots of nutrients and organic matter for your subsequent plants. And one of the things that I, I do as a sort of test of when they're ready to dig in, it's a very simple test, is just to squeeze it with your fingers. And if it's, if it's still quite sort of lush, then you can let them grow a bit longer. If it's starting to get a little bit tough, then it's time to chop them down. Otherwise, you'll find you've got a lot of woody material. So are you, are you squeezing the beans, the stalks, the leaves? Squeeze, stems. Squeezing the stems, yeah. One thing that's really tempting to do is just to leave them and get beans off them. Mm-hmm. But that's really trying to have your cake and eat it. You, you can't have a crop of beans and have it benefit your soil. You can only have one or the other. Because if you harvest the beans and you're taking away all the nutrients which the bean, beans have built up, most of those nutrients go into the beans once you, once you eat them. Anton, this person quite rightly grew field beans. Would it count for any beans? Would they act as a green manure? Field beans are one of the quickest growing and probably the best for the job. So I probably stick with field beans. You could use broad beans because they are pretty, pretty similar. They're, they are in fact the same species. You'll just probably find the seed is a lot more expensive. Any sort of March sort of time will be ready to cut it down and ch- you can chop it up and leave it on the surface or lightly incorporate it. It's really nice to hear someone is actually incorporating green manures into their rotations so that their beds aren't empty over winter because that's always a a mistake, isn't it, to leave your soil completely bare over winter. Well, you're leaching all those nutrients through. We had such a wet winter. Imagine all all that nutrients getting washed through, isn't it, if you're you're just been having bare soil. So you're you're losing your uh, your black gold, I suppose, isn't it, in a way, yeah. You're losing a huge amount. And also the surface of the soil is getting damaged by the pounding action of the rain that causes so structure comes into it as yeah, well yeah so having a green manure protects your soil structure as well as um, retaining those nutrients really quite essential to have something growing over the winter i suspect we'll come back to green manures in future episodes hannah they sound magic plants a good subject to explore so the last question um is from a complete beginner gardener um, who's saying i've never grown anything before and what would you be your recommendation for something easy chris where would you start well i'm going to go back to my blue peter days because it doesn't matter whether you're eight or 80 i think a really good way to learn to garden is to just do a simple edible or pottage hanging basket and in a way it's kind of if you learn to look after that and you're successful with that basket and you grow it well it's going to give you the confidence to expand and start doing other stuff. It's all about um, learning the husbandry and, and also, in a way, I suppose, the skin in the game you get when you grow plants as they become successful. So I would literally just get a small hanging basket, maybe a half hanging basket for the wall. I'd put a tumbling tomato in or a heritage variety of cherry tomato. I would put um, maybe some chives, nice easy plant like chives. And then maybe I'll put a little petunia in, something that will be friendly planting. So you get this little mix, this little montage of plants. You'll be able to eat off it, use it in cooking and enjoy the flower. And just make sure you check that plot, that basket once a day. Does it need a drink? Does it need picking over? And, and then you bond with it. And that's a really easy way to start off gardening. So it's nice and small, nice and manageable. Yes. I guess my thought is, where are you growing? If you have inherited a new garden or even a new allotment, Is it because you want to start producing food for yourself or do you want beautiful flowers? Of course, from the organic point of view, you should really be doing both because you get that lovely mix and variety of of plants which will help insects and pollinators and all sorts of wildlife will come in. So my advice would be wherever you're growing, make sure you grow something you want to look at and you want to eat. Make a list of the things that you really, really love. I mean, I learned to to my surprise that things like strawberries and asparagus are incredibly easy to grow. And I've never succeeded with cauliflowers or cabbages even. What do you think, Anton? Yeah, I'd echo that. First, go with things that you really want to eat. Carrots are quite tricky. Yeah. Um, cabbages, cauliflowers really are. Because you're going to be growing organically, think of things that are horrendously expensive if you're going to buy them organic in the shops. Raspberries, strawberries. You can grow quite easily yourself. Some of the more expensive crops, the reason they're expensive in the supermarket is because they cost a lot to pick. Really makes 
sense to grow at home. So, so things like um, French beans, I'd say, is something really easy to grow. It looks nice in your garden, particularly the climbing French beans. Um, a lot of the salad crops are, are quite easy to grow, particularly things like sort of rocket. And some of the unusual leaves that you don't often see in salad packs, things like mazunas, the red winter mustards and stuff, really, really easy to grow and actually make a salad taste of something. And you can keep yourself in salad for months on end, can't you? Yeah, well? I haven't bought a single bag of salad over the winter. I've just been taking them from my gardens. Things Also just try a range of things because some things undoubtedly will fail. That's just the luck of being a gardener. They might fail this season, but then they might do well next season. So try and hedge your bets. Also to remember is just have a go because the worst thing you can do is kill a plant. It's not You're not hang gliding or doing brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think as the most inexperienced gardener of, of all of us here I think the advice to think about what you eat is the most important we when we set off we did it all by the textbook we looked at our soil and we looked at what was suited to our growing conditions and what was straightforward and then we ended up I think it was beetroot and we eat a lot of beetroot now but we didn't know and then, you know it was all very successful but we didn't know what the heck to do with it I think it's important to say as well all gardens are different I've never been in one garden that's the same as the next you have microclimates you have a different you know wind direction all these things come to a fact and you can't necessarily write about that in a book you kind of got to get to know your plot haven't you I'm going to put a word in for a small fruit tree and you can buy fruit trees that have been specially bred for small areas but if you do that you're going to be picking your own fruit within the next year or so. Apple, pear, cherry, these are all can be grown relatively trouble free. You try and buy organic cherries, you'll be spending a million pounds to find them. So what about flowers? Where would you start with the more ornamental side of gardening? I would certainly, um, for the money saves and ex- exercises, I would hardly annuals because you can buy them as a packet of seeds quite easily, quite cheaply. You can, uh, you'll see if you go to buy a packet of seeds, you'll see the, the letters H A down in the corner, and that just means in come March you can sow them straight into the soil in drills in lines. Things like Gadesia, cornflower, even sweet pea, all those sort of plants, and you can just grow them along the side of your plot. Or if you have an allotment, or you can grow them in containers, easy, and that will just give you a flower all through the summer. Really, come June, they'll get up and they'll start to flower and flower. I'm I'm a great fan of marigolds because they're so bright, they're so colourful, and interweave within your veg patch. And also, you'll get them next year and the year after because they will self seed. Yeah, and limnanthes are poached egg plants as well. Bring in lots of the pollinators and beneficials. Okay, that's brilliant. Really useful. Well, thank you. Sadly, we've come to the end. I hope you've been inspired to get seed sowing, even if it is pouring with rain or even snowing outside. The year is truly on the turn. The days are longer, the birds are singing, and it feels good to be out in the natural world. Next month, we celebrate the campaign to go peat-free in gardening. I get down and dirty into the world of bad compost to see just how well peat-free mixes perform and what exactly goes into the bag. And if you like our podcasts, be sure to press subscribe, then you won't miss an episode. You can write us a review. It won't take long and we'd like to hear your thoughts. Last month, Chris and I were thrilled to get a five star from a loyal listener. Don't forget there's loads of information on the Garden Organic website, gardenorganic.org.uk, about all of the topics we discussed today. And why not head over to the Organic Gardening Catalogue online for all your seeds and gardening needs. And whatever the weather, I hope you're feeling inspired in your organic plot. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music. 